Well, good morning again, church. We've been using the book of Acts for our guide, and we have been watching Paul go from city to city preaching about Jesus. Now, it's only been a couple of weeks for us, but it's been three years for Paul. It's time for Paul to go home. And as he makes his way home, he's selling. He stops into a port city and sends for the elders of the church at Ephesus. Now, Paul's aware that things are going to be tough in Jerusalem. He also knows that this is going to be the very last time he will ever see these church leaders in Ephesus. And so he calls them down, and let me just set it up from the Scripture. <coughs> Acts chapter 20 says, From Miletus Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to him, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility. Thank you, Tom, for that video. And with tears. Although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know I've not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but I have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem and not knowing what's going to happen to me there, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to God's grace. Now, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I'm innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Now, he's getting ready to tell them what he wants to tell them, which begs the question, what did he want to tell them? What was so important that he would ask these church leaders to walk 120 miles to see him? And to be a little bit more practical, what difference does that make to us, you know, and to our situation that we're in these days? Here is what Paul says to these elders, and I think it's important that we see his message. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning you night and day with tears. And when he said this, he knelt down with them all and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. There are three main verbs in that passage. They make the perfect outline, and they also structure the message that all of us really need to take home from this. The first one is very simple. Keep watch. Keep watch over yourself. Keep watch over the flock of God. Now, I know what a, a couple of you are thinking right now. Oh boy, yay, a sermon about the elders of the church. I can just not often sleep through this one because it doesn't concern me. And I've got news that no, what I'm going to say today concerns all of us. Church leaders, elders, small group leaders, even people who don't even consider yourself as a leader. First job is to watch over yourself. And you know, before you ever try to step up and watch over somebody else, you better make sure your life is in order. Church leaders have a sacred trust with God to watch over 
the body of Christ, by first of all watching over their own lives, their own maturity, their own actions. And by the way, just to be clear, church leadership is not an office. It's not something about power. It's not something about prestige. If there ever was an example of humility, it is anyone who steps up to be a leader in God's church. Now, in previous years, we talked a lot about qualifications for elders or deacons. But I want you to know just briefly, they're not. They're not qualifications. They're characteristics of spiritual people. You, you know, a long time ago in school, I had to do paper. And they make you do papers in, a, in school. And I chose this particular place. In Timothy and Titus, there's these long lists of qualifications that people often would read. Well, let's check out so-and-so. Well, yeah, no, yep. And people treated them like a list of qualifications, like it was a, a check this off. You know what I did? I looked at each one of those words, and I looked to learn more about each one of those words. You know what I discovered? Every single one of those words is used somewhere else in the New Testament for you. That's the truth. There is not a single qualification for elder or deacon that is not used somewhere else in the Bible as a requirement for your behavior. Hey, so number one, before you ever start telling somebody else what to do, make sure you are doing the right thing. Number two brings us to the important part of a leader. Watch over the flock. You know, it, it, it never really bothered me to be called a sheep in God's flock uh, until I moved to West Virginia and actually saw a sheep. <laughs> I was raised in a city. I didn't know what a sheep was. I had a member who actually raised sheep. And the bottom line is they are without doubt the most stupid animal in all of God's creation. And without a doubt, they are the nastiest animal in all of God's creation. Except maybe for chickens. Okay, chickens are pretty nasty too. And so I'm not so sure I like being called a sheep anymore. But whether I like it or not, the image of, of a sheep and a shepherd is the one Jesus chose to give us. Jesus as a great shepherd, and all of us as stupid, smelly sheep. <laughs> and by the way, the image of a leader watching out for other people in the church, yeah, they're called shepherds. Which again applies that the rest of us are stupid, smelly sheep. Well, there's number one, leaders watch out. But it goes beyond that, because number two, the second verb is be shepherds of the church of God. I mean, after all, that's your title, to watch out for the flock. You then need to shepherd. And by the way, this is a verb. It's not a noun in the original Greek. It really just means shepherd the flock. And i got to tell you, we could go for five weeks on this passage right here, but we won't. We're going to make it quick. Oh, by the way... The word shepherd, the Latin word for the word shepherd is pastor. You know, so understand elder, shepherd, pastor, overseer. They're kind of all names for the same ministry. And one of the key roles of being a shepherd is feeding. Sheep have to eat. In the first century, the elders of the church often had to deal with food. Uh, for the people in their congregations. We don't really have that problem these days. We don't have to feed you. But we do feed you as leaders spiritually. The elders, pastors, small group leaders, Sunday school teachers, they have the responsibility to teach all of us the ways of Jesus. And, and you know, i got a little comments here and there, and 
I don't like the way we've changed that over the past few years. We've kind of changed that to, well, we want you to learn church history. We want you to learn doctrine. We want you to learn the names of the 12 apostles. We want you to learn the books of the Bible. And the big thing is that we need to learn the way of Jesus. And I see that's changing now. I really do. I see it in our culture and churches changing. And I'm glad and I hope we continue this drift back to really emphasizing how did Jesus live. But another job of a shepherd beyond feeding is protecting. You know, being a shepherd back in the days of Jesus wasn't easy. There were lions and wolves they had to deal with. Again, we're lucky we don't have to physically protect you today. But we do need to protect you from some wolves and lions that are still out there. Paul said, I know after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and not spare the flock. Even in the first century, there were all sorts of false teachers who came into the church with their false teaching, who somehow tried to combine Christianity with some pagan practice or some foreign type of religion. And from the first century, church leaders have had to deal with people infiltrating the church to stir up trouble. So much worse today. And we have so many cults out there. We have secular philosophies. We have atheism. We have humanism. We have a rebirth of the occult. Uh, and a rebirth of old, old religions that's coming back and people wanting to practice them again. So that makes the job of a church leader incredibly hard because they not only, number one, need to know the ways of Jesus, they need to also know the ways of the world out there because the world is actively trying to infiltrate this place. And if that wasn't enough... Paul goes right on and says that you not only are you going to face dangers from outside the church, you're going to face dangers from inside the church. He says, from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. He's saying from your own church family, people are going to stir up trouble. People who want power. People who want to be somebody special. People who can only live with their opinion. Who knows what? Years and years ago, a wise preacher told me, the church attracts neurotic people. That's what it was meant to do. But our problem is that we want to put these people in leadership. And I'm going to tell you today, a biblical leader, from an elder to a deacon to a Sunday school teacher, a small group leader, to anyone who leads you're going to spend most of your time keeping peace and harmony and unity in this place. You know, I've, I've shocked, I guess probably shocked all of you with stories from my past over the, the years. And I could tell, I could spend hours telling you about people who sought power through manipulation and, and lies and slander. One of my favorite stories, I don't know if I told it to you, I was about, uh, oh, I don't know, seven or eight. Single parent, my mother, an elder took us to a restaurant to buy us ice cream to buy our vote for the next election. I had mine. I, I'm seven years old. I'll sell anything for ice cream. Uh, fortunately, my mother was a little smarter than me. I honestly could, unfortunately, tell you a lot of stories about how mean, how uncaring, how nasty people can be who still wear the name of Jesus. A lot of you, and I suspect most of you, can't imagine going to a church like I went to growing up. And you need to know that this place wasn't always that friendly. You need to know that this place wasn't always that loving. But today it is an accepting church. It's a friendly church. It is a very loving church. Because through the years, the leaders have fought 
to keep friendliness and love and unity in this place. Again, leadership is not about power or prestige. It's about protecting this family. Number three, it's also about healing. Is anyone of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil. There's a real good chance that in the first century, the elders served as physical doctors. It just sort of works out that way. It has worked out that way through history. The local priest or whatever, he would also be the one for physical needs. Let me tell you the truth. You have a physical need today. You have a medical problem. Trust me, you're far better off to go to a doctor than talk to me, all right? I learned in West Virginia with all those sheep that sheep need a lot of care. And a, the job of a shepherd very often is just healing and healing the needs of his sheep. Elders still have that job. Deacons have that job. All the leaders of the church still have that job to heal. Sometimes physically, very often spiritually or mentally. And it's not easy. I, again, an, an example. Way back when we had a family in West Virginia who had absolutely no health care. They were working just to make ends meet. They were a very mature and responsible family, uh, but they were just going through a really tough time. And so the elders decided to help them out with a, a little money uh, after an accident in the family. You would not believe the number of people who had health insurance who came to the elders to complain that we didn't give them any money when little Susie broke her arm. Oh, it was amazing. And so I want all of you to know that the position of an elder, in fact, all positions of leadership in a church is incredibly difficult. One final one I want to say here, it's leading. And, and this is probably the most unpopular one of all because we live in a country to where it's been ingrained in us. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. <laughs> That's kind of our, our nature. But the Bible says, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so their work will be a joy, not a burden. For that would be no advantage to you. Sheep have to have a shepherd to survive. And that's actually true of congregations. Shepherds lead. Leaders lead. Leaders lead from the front, not the back. I do believe a consensus is possible among the mature. But there are times, there are occasions, when somebody must make a decision. And that decision might be a very unpopular decision. Churches today are filled with people with all different levels of spiritual maturity. And don't misunderstand that. That's fantastic. That is what we want. Because that means that people are coming into the church brand new and people have stayed around all their lives and are growing as believers. But it does make an awkward situation from time to time. For example, somebody who's kind of new to the church, who's kind of immature as a believer... They may want the church to grow, but come up with an idea that the best way to grow is every Sunday put a $100 bill under one of the chairs in the church. Or at the end of the service, we'll just have a raffle and everybody puts in a ticket and we'll draw for a, a prize. Whereas a mature believer might realize that, well, hey, you know, that might work, but there might be better ways to give God the glory than doing something like that. But what would happen in a church to where the immature far exceeded the mature and you took a vote? Wow. All sorts of things could happen. All sorts of things have happened in various places. That's why 
For good or bad, because you know, leaders are not perfect. Leaders make mistakes right and left. But nevertheless, you need leaders to guide you in maturity, in the ways that we should be going as God's people. Last point is be on your guard, remember. Paul says, look at your current situation, look to the future, but don't you ever forget your past. You know, you have to keep a balance of all these things, or if you don't keep the balance, you're in big trouble. Because if all you do is think about the past, if you think about our glory days in the past, and if you minister to only a select group of people, if you ignore the changes that's happening all around us and the new trends, maybe even ignore new people, you stay in the past. You will die as a congregation. But on the same likeliness, if you spend all your time with the future, you can just become preoccupied, enamored with newer and bigger things, more buildings, newer buildings, build this, make this, buy this new tech toy, buy this new other tech toy, do whatever you can do to please Aunt Susie or Uncle Elmer. And pretty soon, your church will be doing everything in the world except being a church. Oh, it might be fun for a little while. You might be a really great social club, but you know, you will die as a church as well because you're not doing what God wants. That's why you cannot forget the past. That's why we've been looking at Acts all these months. It's been a long journey, and there's only a few messages left, but we've been doing it to remember our past, who we are. That church we've been talking about in the book of Acts, that's our church. That church in the book of Acts and those doctrines, they're our doctrines. And those incredible things you've seen from those men and women in the book of Acts, they're the same things that God expects from all of us even today. You know, as leaders, we have to look to the future. We have to see how we can minister to a brand new culture, brand new generation, as everybody wants to say, a new normal. But just as important, we promise you that we will never stop looking at our past and try to change who we are. You know, this is not where you sit around and wait for Jesus to come. This is where you sit around, get your battery recharged, encourage each other, love each other, and do the work that God has for the church to do. Now, if your idea of church seems a little different than that, I hope you'll go back and look at that book of Acts a little closer. So let me say this. You may think that I've only been talking to church leaders today. However, if you are a church leader, I hope you will never, ever forget how important and how holy your calling is to actually lead the church. It is so easy to get caught up in politics. It is so easy to get caught up in board, board meetings, B-O-R-E-D, board meetings. It is so easy to just get sidetracked, to major in minors, one, by the, one person said. You have to remember it's a ministry. It's a ministry to God. Let me tell you something else that God told me years ago. He said, the sheep are the work, not the wage. If, you're, if you need some place where you're going to be patted on the back and you know, given praise for everything you do, join a book club because you will never get that in the church because taking care of the sheep is a job. Finally, some of you are saying, well, I am not a leader, so why did I need this sermon? Well, number one, because maybe you are a leader. A leader, after all, is simply a person who influences other people. And just about every single one of you influence other people. The only question that remains is, are you a good influence or are you a bad influence? 
But even if you're not a leader and you truly believe you're not, I think sometimes we just need to stop and respect the men and women who do take on that responsibility to lead and guide and direct this place. It's not easy. But as you obviously see from Paul talking to these elders, it's important. So very important to Paul that they would just simply kneel down together and pray and say goodbye. Stan, let's share a final beautiful song as we close our services today.